Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, it's Chris Tobin and me talking about drones. Uh, Yeah, flying around towers and looking at antennas, feed line, coax, and things that might be wrong. Plus, Chris brings uh, the first Internet access to a Boy Scout camp in New York State. Check it out. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by the Telos Alliance and the new Omnia Volt audio processor. More processing power in one rack unit than others give you in three. By BSW Broadcast Supply Worldwide where it's June summer clearance. Save up to 54% at bswusa.com. And by Lavo and the new Ruby Visual Radio Console. Ruby's a new kind of console for a new radio environment. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. Kirk Harnack here, your host. Delighted that you're along. We never know what's going to happen on the show, and today is no exception. Uh, our guest, Dave Anderson, will be along in a little while. He's He's got caught in a meeting. You know how those things go. Dave works with so many uh, customers, especially uh, a network uh, out of Florida called the Joy FM, and, uh, and they have meetings. So we're going to soldier on without Dave for a few minutes. But when he comes in, when Dave joins us, uh, we're going to be talking about rehabbing a tower. I didn't know you could do this, and... Apparently, it's pretty essential. Dave says, I didn't know it either until our uh, PE, professional engineer, told me about it. And they had a tower that needed some rehab. So they're, they're uh, well, it's pretty interesting. We'll get to it when Dave gets here. Uh, joining, see, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee at my usual office here. I work for the folks of the Telos Alliance and uh, have been hosting this podcast for several years now. This is our 353rd episode. And it's about the 368th, the one that Chris Tobin's been here. Hey, Chris, welcome in. How are you? Kirk, thank you. Oh, there we are. Yeah, no, I'm doing well. I'm here in uh, New Jersey in a rack room, uh, Tech Ops Center, I guess you'd call it. And those are traditional punch block 66 uh, Bs behind me. So those of you yeah, man, what, who it's are like, watching will be like, what like, the devil is that? It's like throwback Thursday with all those punch blocks. Seriously, yeah. you still use them, right? Uh, some of them are in use. I have uh, been able yeah. to eliminate a lot of them. <laughs> Now, uh, yeah. well, and this is you know this is actually a subject worth uh, worth touching on here in, uh, in in a few minutes is is okay. People tuning in may think, well, Kirk, why are you eager for uh, Chris to get rid of punch blocks? And Chris, you seem a little eager too. Uh, I tell you what, we got a minute before we do our first ad. Why don't we talk about that for a second? Uh, what's so bad about punch blocks here in 2017? Well, I wouldn't say it's. it's terribly wrong or, or, or bad, it's just limiting. You know, uh, punch blocks don't give you the opportunity in this day and age when there are other methodologies to route audio. You know, these blocks behind me were installed back in 2000, I think, during a renovation project. And at that time, they were still considered, if we will, state-of-the-art. And they were pro- uh, quite appropriate for the time. Fast forward to today, and it's not practical. And, you know, we've talked about audio over IP. We've talked about the interconnectivity or the the methodologies used for connecting audio over IP, whether it be, you know, live wire or weak net or um, uh, what do you call it? Oh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Dante. Dante, yeah, sure. Or or Ravenna. The newer methodology for connection makes sense and is easier to do. I was saying the Cat5 patch panel, if, if you will, if you needed to do that, or just a network and a new routing on the network. Much easier, much easier. And what's behind me are the interconnects for all the studios, the ins and outs hmm. for various studio functionality. Well, let's think about this. If I was running a live wire system, all of what you see behind me would exist on one little cable or maybe two cables. So right there is, is, is savings in one space. So now you can do more in the space. Like this room, if I were to do it over again, I could actually make this room a studio because I can move everything that's here <laughs> into a smaller space, more efficient yeah. uh, arrangement. And, you know, some people are like, what? Yes, that's what you can benefit. That's how you benefit. So to say that 66 blocks are bad, no. Are they inappropriate for today's uh, studios? Probably. I mean, they still have their place in some things, but, you know, not for this. And, uh, you know, that's that's something to consider. But, yes, uh, most of those blocks behind me are dormant. It's just there's no sense in taking them off the wall because I can't use the room for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, um, uh, we'll tell you what we we got to hit our first uh, sponsor here, but yeah. then uh, um, we we should we should just finish up that talk about punch blocks and 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 you know where 
wear stations. You know, what do you do with them when you take them out? You throw them away, all that kind of stuff. And then we've got some, uh, I think, some kind of cool drone news to talk about. And, Chris, you may have a, a story or two while we're uh, waiting on, on Dave Anderson to be here. Hey, you're watching well, This Week in Radio too. Tech. Hmm? Oh, you do? Oh, do good, a, good. Did you get yeah. got that information over? Yep. Good deal. Good deal. All right, cool. Hey, our show is brought to you in part by my friends at the Telos Alliance. My friends, hey, they're my employer, so I really like them, and I happen to know a fair amount about their gear. Hey, I produced a little video about this new audio processor that is just amazing. Take a look. More top radio stations choose Omnia than all other competing processors combined. Now, meet the Omnia Volt, sharing lineage with Omnia processors like the Omnia 11, electrifying, competitive, market-leading audio in a compact one-rack unit package. With Omnia Heritage built in, the Omnia Volt includes Dynamics Magic from Omnia Chief Algorithm Designer Cornelius Gould, including six AGC sections from start to finish, deep bass, warmth, and stereo enhancers, five-band time-aligned limiter, the world's best presets to get you started right, and spectrally pristine final processing designed by Frank Foti. Omnia Volt users love its quick tweak feature. Quick tweak distills years of processing knowledge and proven approaches into simple controls that turn you into a processing pro. Nail your signature sound in minutes using advanced presets or your own settings right from the Volt's front panel or a PC. Omnia Volt brings charisma to your station's audio. FM translators and low-power FM stand out among the crowd. AM stations maximize clarity and coverage. Digital broadcasts sound clear and musical without fatiguing artifacts. Smart design, clearly visible outside and inside. Input and output connections in analog, AES-3, Livewire, and Multiplex for FM. Automatic input selection handles redundant STLs. Remote control works with today's browsers, tablets, and smartphones. Idealized patch point for external watermarking. And hardened construction to withstand lightning strikes, surges, high RF fields, and harsh conditions. The new Omnia Volt is stunning. Everyone will know you've got an Omnia on your station. Omnia Volt is versatile too. DSP Core Firmware alters the personality of Volt to fit your changing needs. FM, AM, digital transmission, or studio processing. Volt can even be used as a standalone stereo generator. DSP cores aren't extra cost add-ons. Download the functionality you need for free. The Omnia Volt. Omnia audio processing for any station. And a smart upgrade for aspiring broadcasters. Proven audio processing that'll leave your competitors in the dust. Hey, I got it. And I got to tell you, don't, don't go pay four, five, six thousand dollars for an audio processor when you can have the Omnia Volt for under thirty five hundred dollars. Check it out from my friends at Omnia, the Omnia Volt. It is super cool. I got to spend a couple of weeks with one here at my office, and uh, soon have a chance to check uh, to uh, play with one uh, on the air too. So, hey, uh, thanks again to Omnia for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, Chris Tobin, you've got a, a video to share. Um, uh, tell you what, since I, I think Suncast has mine uh, teed up. Let's go ahead yeah, let's and, go and take a one. look. Yeah, let's take a look at it. And uh, go ahead and roll it, uh, Suncast, without any audio on it. Make it fully screened there, and uh, we'll check it out. This is the WSM transmitter site in Nashville, just south of Nashville. And uh, this is available on YouTube if you want to go go take a look at that. Um, and this tower was built in 1937. It's a Blaw Knox Tower. And if you think about it, really, it's two towers. It's a... It's a tower that is supported by guy wires at the middle or at, at the top of, of the one section. And then it's, it's self-supporting from the middle all the way up. So it, this thing is almost 900 feet tall. And so it's uh, 450 feet of self-supporting. Flew the drone right over the top of it. I was within 400 feet of the top of it. So that was legal. And then we took a little trip down it. Now there the, uh, used to be a turnstile FM antenna on it. It's still there. And then just look at this thing. This thing gets uh, painted and checked and tweaked. They really take good care of this tower. Uh, it's, again, the tower of the 50,000-watt AM clear channel radio station on 650 WSM. They get into uh, about 40 states at night, and it is just magnificent. I understand that during World War II, there were guards posted at the transmitter site and at the 8 guy wire anchor points all around the building. Uh, there is also a backup 
antenna. I don't think it's it's not in this shot. It may be in the very final shot for a second or two. So we've passed the halfway point. We're going to back out now with the drone. Sp speed it up a little bit. And uh, there's the, the there's a building at the base. It's quite nice. Uh, they used to have open wire transmission line going out there. And uh, uh, there you go. That so. I, as a lot of you may know, I've uh, I got a Mavic Pro drone. And I've been playing with it to see you know, what usefulness will it have. Not for signal measurement. That requires a much larger platform in the air uh, and a lot of technology that that I don't have the ability to put together. But we're going to be interviewing some folks who do in future shows. Um, I want to see. Can I? First of all, I have an interest in making beautiful pictures and videos of towers. I just think that's cool and put that to some music. And then uh, I have an interest in maybe seeing if we can use it for tower inspections. And the the Mavic platform from DJI, as 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 others are too, um, is very stable. You get a good clear GPS signal. It uh, it uses uh, GPS signals not only from the U.S. GPS fleet, but also from the Russian uh, GPS fleet as well. Isn't that called Glasnost? Um, and uh, so it's you'll often look at the control panel for the, the DJI Mavic, and it'll say, hey, I'm looking at 14 satellites right now. And it can't do that unless it's using you know satellites from several fleets. So that that's that's pretty amazing. And um, uh, so far, I've, I've loved it. Um, another person who's been on our show before in the past, um, uh, Paul Shulens from uh, the Boston area, he uh, he's going to be a guest on the show sometime in the future. We'll, he's got an interest, too, in uh, making close-up tower inspections. And uh, actually, I, I tried this for the first time today. Just today, I went over to a local station here in Nashville, and they have a 180-foot STL tower. They have quite a lot of antennas on this STL tower, and we got it pretty close. We uh, we were a little bit less than two feet away from the tower uh, looking at bolts and connections and uh, feed horns on some 950 megahertz uh, dishes, um, uh, both the, uh, the Scala, now Catherine uh, variety, and the Mark uh, uh, dishes. Uh, so there, we we could in fact we could see uh, pretty well that some of these uh, feed horns uh, might be pitted and need replacement before they get some water ingress in them. So there was there was some usefulness there. Um, you know what I, uh, Chris? Do you have any any comment about what I've shown so far? And in the meantime, I'm going to send another uh, video link over to to uh, uh, Suncast for him to show. Okay. Um, no, I think the drones are great. The videos were excellent, and it's uh, it's fun. But it's also informative. I, I think I'm, the drone video that I worked on this uh, past weekend uh, it was is handy. Uh, the one that, that I sent to Suncast is just oh. a tower shot. But we used the drone yeah. for some other stuff. And uh, it came in real handy. It was pretty cool. Uh, we were putting an antenna mount on a uh, chimney, smoke, a chimney stack of a, of a mm -hmm. building. And I'm in front of this, the stack in a bucket truck about 40 feet up. And I have to put a metal strap around the chimney, the, you know, the brick. Standard uh, chimney mount, but the the, the rooftop is made of a, is a, a sheet metal, so you can't grip it. You can't climb onto the roof and sort of like stand behind the chimney and oh. fasten this cable or position it. So I told my buddy, I said, you know what? Why don't we take the drone and put that on the other side of the chimney? And you tell me where if the strap is is horizontal and properly positioned, I'll pull it tight and lock it down in front. That's what we did. I mean, you know, it's a handy way to use a drone, so you don't have to put somebody's safety at at, at risk on a roof and uh, got everything done just nicely. So there, there are a lot of rules that, that cover drone use. And uh, I'll, I'll point out um, for my own, um, just so, so you know, I am commercially licensed to fly a drone. I have the part 107 uh, certificate from the FAA and have passed that test. If you're a licensed pilot, uh, you can automatically get this. Uh, well, you can apply to get it without taking an additional test, but you have to be current. In other words, you have to have your your currency in place for your your regular pilot's license. And so, uh, in my case, I've, I'm a pilot. I have a pilot's license, but it's not current. I haven't flown in about ten years, and honestly, it was going to cost me about five hundred dollars to get current. That is to take the the uh, the oral test and take uh, the the practical test in the air. Uh, hire an, an instructor, uh, just do all the things that you got to do. Uh, and it was going to take uh, at least a day, maybe part of two days, and get a medical uh, as well. And so uh, I thought, hey, for $150, I can take the Part 107 FAA uh, uh, small UAS, uh, un unmanned aerial systems test, 
So he was five hundred dollars worth versus one fifty. I chose the one fifty, got that, and so uh, at least I'm I'm you know recognized by the FAA and and, and licensed uh, to fly for commercial purposes, not just hobbyist purposes. If you're a hobbyist, you don't have to have a license. You still have to follow the rules. If you're a commercial operator, uh, you have a license and you still have to follow the rules. Um, there are a lot of rules. There's a patchwork quilt of rules because there are state rules, local rules, as well as federal rules, and that's kind of a mess. Um, Suncast, would we be ready to watch this one that's called uh, Two Minute Tower Ascension? Uh, if so, yeah, let's go ahead and roll this. So let me describe what this is. There is a um, there is a, a tower, a tall tower, uh, on the south end of Nashville. It's actually in Williamson County, the north end of Williamson County. And I believe this tower is just a hair under 1,200 feet tall. And there are a number of FM stations on it. In fact, FM uh, is about all that's on it. There's some two-way, but there are no television stations on this tower. So some of the iHeart stations, some of the Cumulus stations are here. Public, uh, I believe a public radio station is here. And um, also there is a uh, Class A uh, radio station here as well. So uh, we're, I, this is actually speeded up. Uh, it, it took longer than two minutes uh, to ascend this tower. But there you can see some 950 megahertz dishes going by. Uh, some two-way. I don't know what frequency it was on. More two-way, more 950 dishes. There are some IP radio dishes on this tower. And they are so, uh, so high up. Because there are some good-sized hills between this tower and most of the radio station studios in Nashville. Now, there's a, a backup antenna. It looks like a kind of a Jam Pro Penetrator style. There on the left hand side, um, and so there's so some of the the the, the STL dishes are the, there's there's one of the IP radio dishes. These are really high. They are far they are farther away from the from the um, uh, Ethernet ports in the building than um, 100 meters. So there's actually fiber and power run up this tower. Uh, John Hedish, who has been on our show, did that work. There's another antenna. I that one may be in use full time or it may be a backup. I'm not sure. Um, and then coming up right, there's a single bay. Bam, that's the Class A friend of mine, uh, Lester Turner. And then we get into uh, a master antenna. It's an ERI 8 bay. And there are uh, three stations that are combined into this. And the end of the video is coming up pretty soon. There we are at the, about 1,168 feet right there. So now that wasn't that wasn't close enough to... Um, you know, make a bolt inspection, to, but you could you could see if something was flapping in the breeze. Uh, and frankly, I could have gotten a lot closer. I think my drone was probably a good uh, twenty feet away from the tower during that whole ascension. And of course, we were watching it. We were on the ground watching it carefully. Uh, that was the first time I'd been up a tower taller than about seven hundred feet. Oh, I'm sorry. That was after the 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 W. Well, I wasn't. I really wasn't close to the WSM tower at all. I was a good fifty to seventy feet away from it most of the time. Um, I did some post production zooming on it, so that was my first and I was first experience with it. I was really happy with how stable the drone was. Now we did this as you could see; it was around sunset, so the wind was really calm, and it, it just felt really stable. And I'm, I'm just telling you this to say to give you an idea of my progression through this this notion of um, uh, of, of flying a drone near a tower. I mean, the last thing I want to do is hurt my drone. I don't want you know it to get stupid or a gust of wind before it can correct, blow it into the tower, blow it into a guy wire, something like that, because um, uh, the tower won't be hurt at all. The guy wire is going to be fine. It's going to knock my drone out. It's going to stop a propeller, uh, break something off, and uh, knock the drone. And you know, the drone's going to fall to the ground to its uh, to its demise. So uh, I, I really want to be very very careful uh, around this. And so today was my first time for flying really close to a tower. I don't have the pictures of, the, of that, that ready. We'll look at that another time or put them in the show notes. Uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was, I was really happy with how stable that it was. And we got some really close up pictures, close enough to see, hey, is the tape coming off of an end connector, for example? Or <clears throat> is there a pitting going on uh, on the top side of a, uh, of a feed horn for a 950 megahertz antenna? Uh, we have one more video here that we could uh, we could show right now and chat about it. Let's uh, see if Suncast can uh, can roll that one for us. Thought we had one more. Here it is. Ah, so this was out in the countryside um, near Harriman, Tennessee, and um, look, it's a, it's a directional FM antenna. I know that because of the parasitic elements that are stuck out the back. Um, 
There's the STL dish, 950, and it's a four bay, and I believe it's a four bay uh, dielectric antenna. And uh, there's the what's called the Kingston Fossil Plant in the background where they generate almost two gigawatts of electricity. Uh, looks like they th this tower is not that old. Looks to me like they put up a used um, 300 millimeter code beacon, or the red beacon at the top. And uh, there's another shot of this tower. I think it was WIJV. Now, interestingly, I, I, I was just driving by and I thought, hey, there's a tower. Let me go fly up it. <clears throat> and um, we kind of figured out from, from looking at the arrangement of the bays that the bays are not pointing the right direction. Now, it's not my intention to get anybody in trouble. That's their business. But uh, it showed me that, you know, the, the, you could certainly use a drone to help determine uh, if something was properly installed. And uh, we discovered that uh, those bays are definitely not pointing the right direction. They, the, if, if that was certified by a, uh, um, a professional engineer to the uh, FCC, um, they're, they're, he had to be somebody had to be confused about the about the direction. They were probably a good thirty five or forty degrees off of the direction that they were supposed to be pointing, and the parasitic elements then hence are also off from from where where they should be. Chris, any comment on those last two videos? The tall one. Oh, those are great. Pretty, I, I, yeah, yeah, that's a pretty view. It's a nice uh, image. And yes, you're right. <laughs> you can use the drone to look for any tape unraveling or. Uh, or a cable harness that may have let go, and you have something flapping in the breeze, which is not good. Uh, yeah, I agree. You don't want to be too close to the tower and suddenly have it have an impact and, and watch your drone come down 1,200 feet. It's probably not good. Uh, but drones, I think, are going to be a, a very handy tool. And uh, you've demonstrated that with several of your videos already. And I know there are several folks I've talked to who do it for a living. So uh, it's pretty cool. And that was a great video, though. So, um, uh, you know, there are plenty of broadcasters uh, across America, some of my stations included, where um, honestly the, the coax is not run up the tower with the proper butterfly clamps that, that you're supposed to use. Uh, you know, sometimes we have to hire tower crews or we don't have all the supplies ourselves and things get put up with cable ties and tape or uh, wire wrap. And, you know, there are plenty of small town stations, maybe even some bigger ones, but plenty of small town stations across the USA that uh, their their engine five eighths coax is um, is attached to the tower in not the not the best approved method possible. Uh, anyway, a drone could certainly reveal something you couldn't see too well from the ground, and that is where those cable ties may have broken. And there's coax that's flapping. By the way, that brings up an interesting technique that I found useful. Uh, if you can get to your tower on a day with a little bit of wind, and if, if, if you're in a rural area, it may, it may be able to get quiet enough there to where you can listen. And just listen carefully to the tower and see if you hear any noise like ding, 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 ding. And, and you, you've taken, you've taken binoculars, so what is that noise? Ah, sure enough, there's, you know, 60 feet of coax that is uh, unattached to the tower. It's sitting there just bang, 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 bang on the tower, you know, all day, all night. And eventually something's going to give there. The, you know, the coax is not not designed to do that for forever and uh, and be okay. You ever run across something like that, Chris? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've uh, I worked at a place. We one day I, was, I used to, I would go out and do a tower inspection. I mean, at the ground level, that is, uh, once a week, go out to the transmitter site, visually walk around, check things, and on occasion I'd try and uh, listen to the tower and stuff, like you said, by putting my ear up up against the tower structure and trying to see if I could hear anything or uh -huh. you know whatever. <laughs> And one time, I, I actually did hear that little clanking. I'm like, "Oh, that's interesting. That wasn't there a couple of weeks ago." I'm like, "Wow!" And it was a, it was a mild, mildly breezy day, so it was definitely a reason for the cable to make noise. And sure enough, it was the um, top half of a seven eighths inch line that, uh, that where the end connector was for the uh, the short jumper cable going to our RPU antenna. The, the bracket, the brace, the U clamp, let go for some reason. It just it, it snapped. And that's what was banging against the tower structure was the brass uh, coupling. And that, that was up 450 feet, and it's a solid leg tower, so you could hear it coming all the way down the tower. It was great. I was like, what? Hmm. Oh, the tower crew, 
they go up there and they, they radio down. Yeah, yeah, you lost about two clamps. You got about 10 feet of cable that just uh, happens to be hanging, you know, banging against the, the towel leg because the coax, the, the soft coax, the short jumper, happened to have a little uh, tie wrap loop attached to it. So that was holding it somewhat against the tower. So it wasn't fully flapping in the breeze where it could have ripped the uh, jumper right out of the antenna. So it, we lucked out. But yeah, the visual inspection and, and audible inspection worked out really well. Huh. Okay. Um, um, I've got one more video to show here before our break. And uh, and, and then after the break, uh, Chris, we'll look at, uh, at, at your video. Um, I just, just a second ago sent this off to Suncast. So Suncast, as soon as you're ready, go ahead and roll it. And we'll uh, we'll narrate it. I got to spend some time in uh, in downtown Nashville, and this tower, uh, this FM antenna is a backup. Uh, it was a backup for years. I, don't, I guess it still is available as a backup. But this is a self supporting tower in near downtown Nashville, just a couple of blocks south of the real downtown area. Uh, it is actually this tower is at the Cumulus Nash facility where they do some nationwide. Uh, 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 programming. They do a lot of content creation there in the country music realm. Uh, looks like there is a, uh, what, eight bay antenna there. It looks like it might be a dielectric antenna on a pole. Now, this tower also supports uh, a, a folded unipole antenna from an AM station. And I don't think that AM station operates full time. It's, it's, it's either the daytime or the nighttime site for uh, an AM radio station in Nashville. I think it's a Spanish language station, but I'm not too familiar with it. But this gives, gives you a nice view. And by the way, th I, I'm not flying the drone this smoothly. <laughs> this is an automatic mode that the DJI drones offer. It's, uh, it's called point of interest. I call it orbit because to me it acts like an orbit. And so what you do is you, uh, you fly the drone up high, up higher, above what you want to orbit. And you point the camera straight down so you can get right over it. And then you tell it, this is my point of interest. You, you hit a button. Then what I did here was I backed away from the tower, probably 50 feet. And then I descended about uh, what, uh, well, I, I started out probably 40 or 50 feet above the tower to set the point of interest. So I came down probably a good 80 feet or so. Uh, you can see I'm, I'm probably 10, 15 feet from the top of the tower. And uh, then you put tell it to orbit. And by the way, there's the Bat Building, the famous <laughs> Bat Building in downtown Nashville, where AT and T is. And there's the Nashville, the official bird of Nashville, the crane. <laughs> Several of those going on. Uh, new convention center, hotels, and all that stuff. It's really growing. Um, and at sunset, so you can see the beautiful sun, the sunset uh, reflecting off some buildings there. Um, so anyway, in orbit, it, it uh, this was not sped up or slowed down. I don't think. I think that's the actual speed there, a couple of minutes around. And uh, there's the sun setting out toward the west. Then I did uh, an, an interesting little uh, camera move here you'll see in just a second where uh, I wanted something a little bit dramatic. Now, this is not my tower. I don't, I don't own it. Um, and I, so I didn't want to get up real close to it uh, like I did today. I had Today I had permission to fly right up close to the STL tower. But here I just kind of – actually, I didn't fly backwards. Because the drone has no collision avoidance backwards. Uh, I flew forwards, and then I reversed the video clip. And there you go. There aren't any cars in the scene that you can really notice that they're going backwards. So there you go. Isn't that beautiful? Now, see, <laughs> I'm one of these guys that loves the silhouette of a tower in the sunset. Uh, Chris, I, <laughs> what did you think about that video? That's a great video. I like it. It's, a, it's a very nice. It's very calming. It's a very nice. Yeah, thing. yeah. I'm. I'm. Uh, if you will go watch these online, I'll put links to them on the show notes. Uh, yeah, I pick out you know kind of new age, you know, calm music, the kind of stuff you'd hear at a uh, when you go get a massage, right? Right. right. Uh, exactly. At a health, you know, health, health, health spa. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Well, cool. Uh, well, I'm not sure if uh, Dave Anderson is uh, going to be able to join us or not. He may still be uh, tied up. If he can join us uh, after the break. We're going to be talking about uh, rehabbing a tower. And when we come back from this break, Chris Tobin is going to uh, tell us about a video that he has that I can't wait to see. I have no idea what it is, but if it's from Chris, it's, it's going to be good. This Week in Radio Tech, our show is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcast Supply Worldwide. And right now, it is their June clearance sale. 
where you can save, uh, depending on what part of the, the web page you read, you can save either up to 54% or you can save up to 89%. <laughs> so I'm not sure which it is. The point is there's a lot of savings, uh, things that they, that they just need to clear out. They bought too many of it or they didn't sell well or they thought they'd sell well and something changed. And so you've got all kinds of things that are on sale at clearance prices. Let's look at a few of them. There is a $30 price drop on the MXL BCD1 dynamic microphone. Uh, that's a nice mic. Uh, check it out. It has a uh, built-in 12-foot XLR. Is that right? No. It, oh, the stand. The stand that uh, uh, is included. You get a 12-foot XLR cable with that. Um, there's the Tascam US32 Mini Studio. It's an audio interface designed for internet broadcasting, offering great sound quality and lots of unique real-time effects. So $40 off the already low price on that. And you can watch a video about that. Just go to this website at bswusa.com. Uh, there are, there's a cool codec pack. You can save up to $1,293 on the Tyline Via portable codec bundles. You get the Via portable codec, two pairs of Shure Audio-Technica Sennheiser AKG or Biodynamic headsets with installed connectors, and a rugged Gator utility bag. So that is a cool codec pack. You can save up to almost $1,300 on that. Also, headsets uh, from Shure, this BRH50M. I've used these before. These are nice. Combines lightweight comfort and superb audio quality. It's got a high-performance mic. does sound good. Uh, and uh, it offers a focused polar pattern with very clear voice reproduction. Um, and it's, uh, it's a low-profile look. It's a good-looking headset. There's also a broadcast mixer from JK Audio. These are B-stock. They come with uh, factory warranty, factory sealed. But they're on sale. You can save $340 on the B-Stock version of JK Audio's Remote Mix 4. Uh, also, finally, the Optimod 5500i 5-band processor. Low latency, uh, RDS, RBDS generator in a compact 1RU package. Uh, price too low to show. Give them a call at bswusa.com, and they'll be glad to tell you all about it. Hey, if you want to jot it down real quick, make a note. Their phone number is 800 426 84 34. That's 800 426 84 34. If you have ever talked to BSW on the phone, you know how super helpful they are. They, their salespeople, they, 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 they live and breathe uh, broadcast equipment. And one more advantage to doing business with BSWUSA.com is they have an enormous warehouse of this equipment in Ohio, near Columbus, Ohio, right down the street from the airport. So if you need something, oh my gosh, I got to get this here tomorrow. Well, with BSW, you can almost always get it tomorrow. That's because they'll put it on a plane that night, order by 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, they're there packing the orders up late at night, get them right over to an enormous UPS facility at Columbus, Ohio, and out it goes by UPS. And you can have something the next day. I have done that. I have gotten myself in a bind and needed a CD player and a uh, and a blank panel and a rack shelf, and because I had to get out of there the next day, so I ordered it from bswusa.com, and my by golly, it showed up the next day, uh, even in rural Mississippi. Can you believe that? Showed up the next day, and bam! Oh, you know what? I had to order a Middle Atlantic rack as well, not the big ones, but uh, a little little um, uh, wooden one that goes on a desktop, and it was there the next day. Great service from bswusa.com. Thanks a lot, BSW Broadcast Supply Worldwide, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, Chris Tobin, uh, he's with me, episode 353 of This Week in Radio Tech. And uh, Chris, what do we got here for a video? You want to tell us about it? Uh, yeah, one second. But before I do, I need to just do a shout out to Darren Moss. Uh, Darren is the general manager at Cloud365 in Auckland, mm -hmm. New Zealand. And he wrote to me just to say thank you for uh, coming up with, uh, how did he put it? Creative broadcast solutions, which is what he likes to do. So he's... Uh, <laughs> Does some work with broadcasters, and he's now is a, runs with a company that does cloud computing. So I just want to say thank you for the email, and uh, appreciate your your watching and listening. And uh, just uh, anyone in the uh, is Simon and the gang they're from New Zealand, aren't they? From uh, yeah, AVC. Hey, yeah. AVC, yeah. Mm -hmm. AVC, yeah. yeah. So I was like, all right, you know, just want to say thanks, and it would be nice just to say hello to folks when they do write in. So now, the video. 
I'm uh, working on a project. Like I have nothing else to do on the weekends. So <laughs> uh, I'm helping out a friend. Uh, it started a year ago and it just, uh, with the winter in between, things came to a halt and then uh, took a fever pitch when the weather started to turn warm. So let's run the video and I'll explain more as you have to watch. Oh my, you've got actors in your drone video. Well, that's me in the standing on terraform right now. <laughs> well, I was watching the video. Now I'm not seeing it. No, you see me now. There we go. It seems like when uh, when we take the video, we lose your audio. Oh, is that so? Oh no, no. Okay, okay. We got okay. your audio. So what? What's so the what's the are. project here? The project is bringing wireless internet to a Boy Scout camp in the Catskills in New York State. Oh, how cool! So, Yes, in the background you see a lake. Uh, yeah. in, in the lake, uh, across the lake, just in the the background is the campsite of one of twelve campsites. So the tower that we're on, we're going to be putting a, a five point eight gig antenna dish, pointing it in that direction. We're also going to point it in the direction of another building and a couple of others to bring uh, internet service out to these facilities. Uh, on the top of the tower, it's a hundred foot, one hundred ten foot tower, self supporting. There's a 900 meg ubiquity that we're going to use to shoot across to the other side of the camp because there's no way 5.8 will work. That's it. just a short oh. video. And um, that's going to be 900 meg, and we're going to get probably about 100 megabits of data path. That's all we need for that particular camp. So we're trying, mm -hmm. I'm maximizing every bit of technology we can come up with. And because the budget's uh, somewhat austere and putting up towers in a campsite is not the easiest thing to do, I'm actually repurposing a utility pole at one of the locations, and then pole mounting a 40-foot mast to that. So think of a telephone pole, a wooden pole. There's no no utility power, no phone, no phone connection. It's just a bare pole. And we're doing a pole mount and putting a 40-foot mast on top of that to mount a 5.8 dish to connect to that tower that you're looking at in the video. That, yeah. Uh, that creates yeah. a link. Yeah. So uh, that's, that, that's what I've been doing on the weekends is climbing towers atop of a – 12,600 square acre facility. Wow. By the way, the wow. only time I do get cell service, uh, my cell service works great when I'm on the tower. <laughs> and I'll, I'll bet yeah, we're, you. We're, go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. You, you bet me what? Well, I'll, I'll bet you if you were trying to hit a, uh, a, a ham repeater, uh, that would also work well from up on the tower. Years ago, I bought one of those little bitty pocket i forget what brand it is but i'm sure the our ham friends watching the show will are listening will know it i mean it's almost the size of a credit card okay it's kind of a thick credit card but it's just a little uh uh two meter transceiver and you can't i don't know even even know if you can change the batteries they, they charge up uh, and uh, by maybe by usb or something but anyway it's and it's just got a little whip antenna on it just just a little telescoping antenna like an am fm radio used to have well I, you know, I never really could hit much of anything with this little walkie-talkie. It might have been a quarter watt. But I was doing some tower work years ago in Mississippi, and I knew that this repeater was something like 35 miles away. So I thought, I'm going to just bring this little radio up and see if I can hit it. So I'm up the tower. I may have been 200 feet up the tower. And I got the radio out and tried it. Oh, man, full quieting. It was just beautiful. It's amazing what line of sight does on an unused frequency. It's it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? <laughs> well, I will tell you that uh, there is a, a ham repeater on that tower site, so uh, hitting that was ah. easy. But I, while I was up on the tower, I did try a couple of repeaters that I know down in the lower part of the state or down toward New Jersey and New York City. And from the top of the tower or midway up, I was able to talk to friends of mine in New York City, and they were asking me, are you in the neighborhood today? I was like, no, no, I'm not. I'm, 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 not, I'm not nearby. And they said, where are you? And I told them. They're like, what? I said, well, I'm on top of a 1,600-foot mountain on top of a 100-foot tower. So I'm 1,700 feet above sea level talking to you down the valley, Hudson Valley, to New York City. So, yeah, it worked out really well. <laughs> so, and, and, I'm, and I'm sorry if, if I missed if you, if you said it, but uh, so how were you getting – what was your source of Internet to hop it over to the tower and then hop it on to the, to the Boy Scout camp? Oh, uh, at, the, at their headquarters building, they're receiving a, a cable uh, modem. Internet service ah. from okay. Spectrum, I think it is. So we're gonna we're gonna branch it out across this network, and um, it should work out nice. 
it's it's just the start of a pro. There's a few parts of the project that'll be phase two and three. So right now we're in phase one, and uh, it's uh, it's. I will say there's more to come, <clears throat> but it has been a challenge. And uh, Jim Castro, who works with the Scout Scouts, the Greater New York Council, has been very instrumental, very uh, supportive, and uh, has come up with some great ideas. And we originally were thinking of placing small monopole towers on site. After looking at the cost, we had to sit down one afternoon, evening, and I think we spent probably six hours in a conference room trying to figure uh. out, thinking out of the box, what other choices do we have to mounting antennas? And as I'm looking out the window, I'm saying, well, what if we just use the tree? Or what if we use, oh, wait, what's that pole doing? And all of a sudden, it just like a light bulb went off, and now we're making connections, and it's working. So, uh, so th it's, it's th that that tower that that you were you were showing is that purely a hop point, or is there something at the base of the tower that you need access to? Uh, at the base of the tower is a small communication shack where we're putting in the switch, uh, UPS and stuff, and the radios will come down to that, and then we're going to distribute. That'll be our distribution point. So everything okay. will come into there, and from there we go out to the various sites, uh, and uh, it works out. It looks like it's going to work out just fine. So, and really, what I was getting at, and you've you've really answered it, but uh, is if if all that tower was was hopping from the, a source onto the next place, and you only needed two dishes, you know, uh, and you just needed the height, uh, maybe you know to look down on one on one receive site, could you get by? Would you want to get by with not really with, with only having power up there uh, where the where the radios are, um, or you m might you just might as well bring the uh, bring the Ethernet all the way in, into the building so it's available there if you want it? Well, there's two schools of thought. You could just do a passive, so to speak, relay, yes, uh, provide power, and then just have the one radio relay to the next, uh, as it's done back in the day with microwave receivers and transmitter links were done that way. But because of what you can do with this, uh, the technology and the fact that it's a LAN connection, I thought it was best to bring the cables down to the shack, have access there, because we could do more. There's other things we can do with that, like a VoIP phone could be plugged in there. We could talk oh, and communicate, yeah. you know, things like that. Because remember, this is a facility that uh, stringing phone lines, uh, you can easily extend way beyond the distance of a standard phone line can handle. Because the central office is not on site, and we're talking 12,000 square acres of land. Uh, so it's <laughs> it's not like as if you can... The DSL that's on site right now is actually the D slams are on the property in places where I don't know how these guys tolerated climbing to that spot to put a box, and they're using bonded T ones and it's barely working. So you can mm. just imagine what it would be like to do more of that, which they don't want to do. So that's why we got called in um, to to do this project, my buddy's company, and uh, I got the call to come up with the creative solution. <laughs> and so far, it's working. So um, that, that that's now. So, so what's after this portion of the project? What's next? Are you going to have more antennas on the tower to get more campsites? Yes, yes, there'll be more. That that was yeah. the first day. Uh, that was two weekends ago. So we'll have mm -hmm. one, two, three. There'll be four antennas up there, and the dishes. They'll be pointing in different directions. Yes, and then each of the sites. The way I've worked with them to design it. Each of the sites will receive the main signal, and then those sites will break it out locally. So we could do a little nano beams, uh, you know, ubiquity products and just distribute it accordingly. So this way it's just one connection in and then locally do what we have to do to make it work. Because each of the campsites, remember, you're talking trees and, and uh, foliage and there's a oh, lot yeah. of obstructions. So so we, we come up with some creative uh, uh, setups, which is going to be nice. And then I also in phase two, or maybe we'll do it in this phase, but phase two will have it so that if they want to do an ad hoc connection, they can just put up a little tripod with a dish on it or a mon an an um, what do you call it? omnidirectional antenna. And using a point-to-multi-point linking, they could just link into the network, do something at the campsite, and when they're done, close up and pull out. So think of it like a, like a mobile Marine Corps operation you know, in the battle zone somewhere. How are you managing either the bandwidth itself or at least the IP address range that the end users pick up? What's the scheme that you're using, if any, to manage all that? Well, the scheme will be, it'll be VLANs. Uh, 
we'll have the standard uh, VLAN zero, which will be the maintenance uh, IP range, which will just be used for the internal folks, the IT crew. And then the VLANs will be each of the sites for the Wi-Fi, the wireless access. Uh, we're going to use all of the Ubiquiti's edge router material, the technologies. Uh, everything will be um, set up so that they'll be isolated. The, the Wi-Fi units will be isolated, so you can't go between them as users. Uh, each one will be its own VLAN, so you can't talk to somewhere else. It, that's how we're going to manage it. This way, you don't have just a complete 24-class IP range and everything is just flooding the network because that just slows things yeah. down. So that's what it's going to be. Yeah, it'll be it'll be VLAN arrangement, managed switches, and um, it just go from there. And it, you know, it'll it'll work the way it should. And using I sure would portal like access. It'll yeah. be fun. Oh, okay. So so okay, so portal access. So that means that uh, you you have to be given permission to to get on the network, right? Right, right. I mean, the permission okay. will be minimal because everything will be locked down. The idea is just to be able to offer the scouts access for basic stuff, email, web browsing, nothing crazy. We're not talking 12 hours of Netflix or Hulu or YouTube videos. But uh, the idea is just to be able to give them access during the breaks time when they're doing uh, meal breaks, or dining hall, dinners, lunches, stuff like that. The campsites themselves, out in the camps, whether it be tents, cabins, or lean-tos, if you get any of the signal from the dining hall areas, that's great. That's not intended. The idea is just for the main uh, campgrounds where they gather for various functions. And then after that, they break out back to their local campsites. The internet service is not going to be there because that def uh, is defeats the purpose of the scouting program. Yeah, well, yeah. All weekend. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I have to say, though, it's a campsite that I used to camp at as a scout. So I'm actually like, looking at this going, wow, the last time I was here was a long time ago. And I mentioned to the, the ranger, the uh, senior ranger, I said, yeah, my campsite, I remember, had leaned to. So he goes, Oh, you're in the other side of camp. I said, where's that? <laughs> Over by the Delaware River. He goes, that's the only site that you, you must have come from the New York City group from one of the boroughs. I was like, well, yeah. He goes, yeah. That only one borough operated out of there. I was like, oh, that must have been my borough. So, yeah, the, the folks in Brooklyn, uh, that's where we were. Over by the river on the ledge. Isn't that, isn't that great, though, to, to go back somewhere where you were at, what, probably 35 years ago or more? And yeah, yeah, and be, exactly. And be, and be able to help out. Yeah, well, that's the best part. When when I was first approached by the, the gentleman from the Boy Scouts, who was actually <laughs> this is even better. He's a mutual friend of the GFQ network, and it was a meetup at a Windows Weekly event <laughs> in the city uh -huh. with Mary Jo and, and Paul Thorat. Uh -huh. And he's uh -huh. talking to me. He goes, "Oh, you know, I watch your show." I'm like, "Oh, cool." And we got talking. He tells me about this project. He goes, you ever hear a call place called Ten Mile River? I'm like, yeah, I've heard of Ten Mile River. And I started rattling off all the things. He's like, oh, have you? I, yes, I used to camp there. And then he, he mentions the other scout camps here in this city, Alpine and Pouch. I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. I did that too. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> and that's things just took off from there. And I have to say, it's the funniest thing to be walking around the camp and going, I remember that. Oh, that. And they would talk about things that used to go on over the years. And I'm like, Oh, yeah, yeah, Order of the Arrow. Yep, I remember that. Oh, yeah, yep, yep, we did the vigil. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it was fun. It's, <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's been a project that's really worked out well. I've learned a few things, tried a few ideas that on paper, both the guys I'm working with at the scout organization and myself are like, well, it says on paper we can't do it. We tried it. It worked. So we've been doing things that they say can't be done. So it's, it's, it's been great. I had a, a bit of experience a couple weeks ago at our cabin uh, in in Gatlinburg, and uh, excuse me if I've mentioned this before, but I provided Wi-Fi to um, to the pool area, uh, which is you know Gatlinburg is is very mountainous, and and in fact from our cabin to the pool it's about 200 feet laterally and 200 feet down, so it's a 45 degree angle down to the pool, and uh, it's through thick forest. And the, the the pool is in a little valley. There's a stream that goes by it, and it's it's a nice little pool. I mean, it's a it's a you know concrete pool, and they fill it up, and it's it's not it's cold as can be all all summer long because the the pool itself only gets about three hours of sunlight every day because it's, it's at the bottom of a valley, a narrow valley. Anyway, uh, no Wi-Fi out there. And I, I know. Look, I know I should be on vacation. I should just enjoy the lack of connectivity. But oh, you know how hard that can be. Uh, it's like withdrawals. So I thought, you know, my cabin is just right up there, just right up there. And except for the trees, it's a clear shot. 
And there's even some supporting members for the deck that are at a 45 degree angle off the side of the house. So I thought, hmm, ubiquity um, hotspot, the, the ones that are about, what, uh, nine, ten inches tall and about four inches wide. And I'll just uh, and cable that tie. Strap. Locals. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, I think it was about 50 bucks. And I bought that and just uh, drilled a hole in the wall and ran that inside to the power supply and then the router. And uh, configured it up, and uh, uh, I named it. Um, I named it Cobbly Knob Security. <laughs> so who knows? <laughs> that's the name of the, that's the name of the subdivision. And so uh, at, at the moment, it's it's password protected. I don't I don't want anything you know nefarious going on on uh, on an IP address that I pay for. So, but anyway, now I have Wi-Fi, and so my phone works at the at the pool because the T-Mobile phone works will work fine off Wi-Fi. So anyway. Uh, mine's not nearly well, as dramatic as yours, but anyway, it's kind of cool. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say the withdrawal of Wi-Fi or internet access. While we were uh -huh. uh, a couple of weeks back at the headquarters building where we were set and staging everything, we're out in the front of the building. Uh, we were testing the idea of uh, heights. So I was using a fiberglass collapsible pole to test the height of a 5.8 dish where things will work. So as we're out, out there testing these things, these two persons come up and um, they have their phone in their hand doing the swirl, you know, the swirl thing. <laughs> yeah. and, and they come up, they go, uh, is, is there a Wi-Fi here? And do you have the password? And I, I'm like looking around, I'm going, oh, this is a good <laughs> time to have some fun. I say, Wi-Fi? You know, um, no, not really. And they look at me like, what? I say, yeah, I know you think we should have Wi-Fi. It's a scout camp. You're supposed to sort of be separating yourself from the day's uh, chaos and just... <laughs> being one with nature and learning how to be prepared. No. Mm -hmm. But if you want, a pr go out this road, down the dirt road, which is a dirt road, hang a left. When you get to the intersection three miles down, Wi-Fi should start. Matter of fact, cell service should begin just about there. And then you'll be able to connect and, and, and Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is you need to do right away. And they looked at yeah. me like, yeah. thought I poked them in the eye. And they're like, really? Did, is there anything in the building? I said, the building behind me has nothing i do there's no wi-fi here you're gonna to have to go down three miles and you can get what you need <laughs> or go back to the campsite and enjoy the fact you're in a weekend in the dad skills and the two of them totally like didn't get it and like okay and they walk away you know just totally distraught and the guys i'm working with one of them is the ranger he looks at him like now that's gonna be the best conversation i've heard in ages <laughs> because we have that question every day i never thought to just tell to go down the road or you know, I basically I was trying to tell him, look, take a hike, go back to the campsite. I said, I don't know what to tell you. There's nothing here. And I was just like, it was so <laughs> funny to watch how they had no they had no idea what to do. Oh, it was five o'clock in the evening, the sun was setting, and they were like totally lost. I'm like, you're at a campsite. What do you mean you have nothing to do? Build a fire, sit back, relax, talk to somebody. You're in a group of people. You know, I kid you not, I, go, to the, go to the dining hall that evening. Yeah. All yeah. these kids. Nobody's talking to each other. They're all trying to figure out how to make their phones work. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm hitting my hand on my forehead, going, "Really? This is I like, I I took for granted those days at camp." <laughs> yeah, um, man, it's it is amazing how we become addicted, and and I, I'm laughing. I'm finding a lot of humor in what you're saying because in all humor, there's a little bit of truth, and so I, most yes. of us, you know. E even those of us, you and me, grew up without any kind of connectivity at all until we were probably in our late twenties or early thirties. And yet, now that yes. we have it, we 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 crave it. We 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 want to be connected. Hmm. Yeah, my connectivity when I was a kid was: here's my mom's phone number or my neighbor's phone number. Here's where you yeah. can find me. And <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky, exactly. you're in the backyard, they can holler out to you and say, "Hey, your mom's on the phone." After that, there was nothing. <laughs> and and the, your parents even told you. Don't come home till the sun goes down. That's correct. So you're, That's correct. You're out there playing. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, we're going to wrap up the show in a minute. <clears throat> we got one more video to show you after the break. Plus, Chris will have his famous tip of the week for you. So we got two good things coming up in just a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to thank our folks, uh, our friends at Lavo for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Uh, here's the website. It's Lavo.com. L-A-W-O. That's a German word. Lavo.com slash twerk. If you use that URL, Lavo.com slash twerk, it will take you immediately to a special page where they show you 
all their on-air radio products. Radio consoles that are designed to support you in the creation, preparation, and broadcast of your radio program. Quick, efficient, intuitive work guaranteed because they know how to, des how to design this stuff. Uh, virtual radio also. Technical equipment must work and Lavo software adapts to your workflow with uh, ideally matching components. Always there when needed, but never in the way. And they have all kinds of automatic stuff like automatic level setting and automatic mixing that really just makes your job easy. It just makes you, makes you look good, sound good as a broadcaster. They have routing systems uh, that, uh, that can do Ravenna, uh, audio over IP from, from Lavo. The new virtual radio system called Relay, that's pretty cool. We ought to do a whole show on that coming up. Uh, the new Ruby console, it's a new way of thinking about radio workflow where physical and on-screen multi-touch controls combine to give your on-air talent a new way to create. They're going to love it. So check out Lavo at Lavo.com. They have so many advantages and benefits. Uh, their equipment, these guys, they, look, it's German engineered. You almost don't need to say anything else. It's built with redundancy and backups and super high quality uh, metalwork, electronics design, uh, execution. It's just great stuff from top to bottom. And their software development is also just wonderfully intuitive, beautifully designed. Uh, I mean, it's designed to work for people to work it and to get the job done of creating compelling content. Uh, of course, Lavo is the company that makes these great big consoles for live uh, live events like the Olympics. Uh, you know, the BBC has Lavo consoles. The CBC in Canada does too, as well as NPR here in the United States in their Washington headquarters, uh, Lavo consoles there. So check them out if you would. Remember the website, it's lavo, L-A-W-O dot com slash twerk. I'd appreciate it if you would use that web URL when you go there. We'll get a little uh, ding a ling -y, a little credit that uh, that you visited, and uh, you'll get right to the radio stuff right off the bat. Thanks to Lavo at L-A-W-O dot com slash twerk for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. All right, Chris is going to have a tip for you in just a minute. I got one more quick video to uh, to bring you, and uh, this is the Suncast. This is the WMSE antenna video. If you can roll that, please. So here we go. This is in Milwaukee at the uh, Milwaukee School of Engineering, and they have a, a radio station there. I'm assuming it's a Class A station, but it may be a little bit more power than that. I just I don't know. I haven't looked it up very well. Yeah, I'd be easy enough to look up. I guess I should. And right around sunset, I had a chance. Uh, actually, some some showers had rolled through, and they had just moved out of the area. It was still cloudy, but uh, had a chance to make the drone do um, an orbit or a point of view mode. Uh, excuse me, a point of interest mode around the, uh, the, the uh, antenna. I'm looking at that antenna, <clears throat> and Chris, maybe you have an opinion too. I, well, it's an ERI antenna. It's the rototiller style, but I believe this is the Harris version of the ERI antenna because it's got a little extra bend to the end of it. And the bays are a little bit, mm, look a little more flattened out than uh, than what I usually see from the standard ERI design. So I, 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 if I'm yeah, not mistaken, I think, I think correct. yeah, Harris had their own version of this with a little extra kick to it uh, in terms of design. I don't know if it got out any differently, but uh, I'm sure that somebody thought it did. So here's some different drone shots. Now, these shots were, pro I was probably 40 feet away from the tower, maybe up to 60 feet away from the tower. And uh, this is, again, the, the uh, point of interest, uh, automatic going around the tower. I, I, I zoomed in electronically uh, in post-production on some of these shots. Just love to see this. I don't know why. I love to see bent metal in the sky. I just think it's so cool. By the way, you may notice this tower is guyed with four guy wires on a three-face tower. And uh, they had a pretty limited roof space to deal with. So that's, that's the way they had to set up the guy wires. Um, well, look at that. It's so pretty. Uh, I believe that our friend Chris Tarr played a hand in uh, the installation or certainly now in the maintenance of uh, this transmitter. It's right in downtown Milwaukee, so the coverage downtown has got to be really good. It certainly covers the school well. Did a few little effects there. Yeah, this, this video wasn't for the purpose of an inspection. Uh, this video was for the purpose of just looking pretty and, uh, and going around. A little added highlight there.
Chris, any comment or play-by-play -play here? No, no, that's great. Three bays, nice squish, squash the signal to the horizon. A couple of watts out, that covers the area just nicely. Yeah, I, I'm I assuming... I'm using Philly mm -hmm. Strand. The guy wires at the uh, yeah, Bay Area, yeah. Philly Strand, I'm sure. But it should be. <laughs> and then I, th th I uh, hovered over for a little bit. In fact, I called this the hover cam. <laughs> a little post-production. Like black and white <laughs> shot from a guided missile. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Well, I assure you, there was no ill intent here. I was just looking. <laughs> you know, people, people, get, people get a little scared and nervous when you say the word drone. And so yes. um, I, I often just call it, I, I have an aerial camera platform. An aerial camera platform. Well, that's what it is. So you, it's, I mean, I, really, so you what good would I mean? I, I'm not. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go. Ahead. I keep interrupting you. Go ahead. You 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 navigate an ACP. Yeah. Hey, there you go. Sure. <laughs> that, the, I don't know. Using the military acronyms. Yeah. Sure. There's a little closer. Now, some engineers have said, "Gee, that's that's mounted a little bit close up to the top of the tower, and it looks like there maybe should have been a a lightning rod on top of the tower. It looks like there's a couple of clamps at the very top, and you kind of wonder, well, why isn't there a lightning rod clamped to the top of that tower? By the way, is that tower is that Rhone 25, or does it look like a little bit bigger than Rhone 25? It looks bigger than maybe Rhone, Rhone 25, maybe 45. Yeah. Not sure. Yeah, that, that's mounted typical. That's a typical installation. The top is a stub that you keep above. That's exactly how you mount those. Yeah. I've seen it done. Yeah, there's a university here in town that has one like that. And lightning rod, um, yeah, six one half does another you could put at the top, but they probably figured the top piece that's up there uh, at the top of the triangle stanchion is probably sufficient. Yeah. Taller towers way in the background there. You can see those going by. There's some you know, probably oh, 1,500, yeah. 1,800 footers over there. So that did, did a little effect here, hovering over the top. Just about see straight down the brackets and the bays oh, themselves, cool. right over the right over the tower. Now, that does that does look like one of those military shots, doesn't it? Oh, oh yeah. gosh! All right, and then the final the final pass by and heading out uh, heading out to to the campus. So that's it for the for the video. I hope you enjoyed those. I love making these videos, and uh, um, you know maybe well the whole I'm making pretty videos, doing a little bit of you know obvious inspection, and I'm going to have for you more videos that are close up when I visit my radio stations in Mississippi this coming week. I'll, I'm going to be getting some closer shots. We'll actually be doing some real actual inspection work, but the hot topic or one of the hot topics is not just inspections, but is doing pattern measurement. And there are some nuances. You can't just go put an antenna on the receiver on the drone and fly it around. Uh, it's more complicated than, than that. And so uh, we've been doing some research on this. There's a company out of Australia called Six Arms, and they have got a lot of work under their belt in uh, pattern measurement. Uh, our show friend, uh, Gary Klein, uh, just returned from Australia where he got uh, a preview of uh, or a good look at, at antenna measurements with that. Also, our friends at uh, Cavell and Mertz um, uh, are uh, John Dean. Uh, they're they're doing um, uh, they're offering as, as a service now, and, and there are others. But uh, uh, there's some 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 um, um, what's the word? Some some mistakes that can be made in determining signal strength. It's, it's a little bit harder than one might think, especially when you consider uh, bounced reflections off the ground and off other objects. So there's some things that affect the uh, accuracy of the measurements. Anyway, point is, we're going to have some future shows where we're talking about that. And by the way, about next week's show, I'll tell you that in a minute. Right now, Chris Tobin's going to give us a tip of the week, some words of wisdom. Words of wisdom they are. Well, since I've been doing so much Ethernet cable runs for the last couple of weeks, I thought I'd bring this back out and uh, remind everybody that when you're making Ethernet cables, you know, RJ45s, try and do it the right way. I've had people make stuff, and then I wind up coming in and cleaning up the mess. It's annoying. So here is a simple, straightforward kit. As you can see, you have the cables. Do take the time and adjust the screws so that you just score the jacket so you can properly pull it apart and do a nice, clean cut. Here is the crimper itself, all in one place. And here is a punch tool in the event that you're doing some of those, uh, uh, what do you call those, RJ blocks. They, they have the full mm. block type things where you can punch it in. 
And then I just keep the connectors and boots in here. Now, one thing to remind everybody, and it's very important that you consider this, don't forget to put the color code chart in your the ah. other day working folks <coughs> making some cables. All I kept hearing was, oh, I think I got it right. <laughs> and of course, they, they, they didn't. So there we are, oh. snipping RJ45s. <laughs> yeah, you need to make sure. The good news is if you forget to put the chart in there, at least you could not forget to Google it. Just Google RJ45 <laughs> pin out and get the, right, get the B variety. See, if, you're in a, yeah. if you're in a campsite that doesn't have service, ah. you need to do this. This yeah. is where I was going yeah. with this. You may be at a transmitter site that your service <laughs> might be spotty, power went out, yep. or you're installing for the first time your internet service. You're, I'm it trying to bring work. the internet here. I can't look it up. <laughs> and also, don't forget the pinout chart for a crossover cable. Those come in handy, uh -huh. too. So the other thing is, please consider this. You see this little mechanism here? That's known as an RJ45 and a boot. Right? Yeah. Not about a boot. Okay. Yep. Very straightforward. Yeah. And if you notice, right now I can, I can prick the little tab. Yep. But if I have the boot on my RJ45, it catches nothing. So now yeah. my cable terminated with the RJ45, and the boot can be pulled through a bunch of cables, gr crabgrass, weeds, rooftop of mess, and not break off that little tab. I can't tell you how many times I've worked on projects with folks who don't pay attention to these details, pull a 200-foot cable, and I get it in my hand going, oh, no, the tab caught something in the conduit. Yeah. Okay? And, and, these and now you have to re-terminate it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, on, on some runs, you can't pre-terminate by the pre-terminate because you got to run the cable through stuff and whatnot. Sure. So, so, so this little so to, is a to, to add to what you just said there, how many times have you terminated a cable with an RJ45 and then you realized, oh, I forgot the boot. Oh, well, I'll just oh, use it. No. Cut that connector off and put the boot on and re-terminate it. Because if you pull it backwards through some cables, you're going to have to re-terminate it anyway. anyway. So you might as well do it now. And then you won't have to re-terminate it again, ever. I, I, I've, I've made some test cables for this project I'm working on. I have two 150-foot uh, Ethernet cables for testing radios and trying stuff out before we permanently make connections and mounts. Mm -hmm. And they have boots on them. We have another cable that was made by somebody else. So I don't know where we got it from. It doesn't have boots on it. Guess what? My RJ45 stay in the switch port. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> when, yeah. when those things get bent, have they have no more springiness. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly what happened. Yes. Good, good, good advice. Good advice. Chris, we got to go. Uh, just a housekeeping note. We'll explain. Uh, Dave Anderson was scheduled to be our guest. He's in the middle of a tower rehab project, and we promised he, or we advertised that he would be here on the show. But Dave got caught up in a lengthy conference call. I've, I've been on and off chatting with him online here during the show, and he apologizes. He wasn't able to make it, but he's got pictures. Uh, we'll see if he can have some video, and we'll have him on a future show because this is cool. This is important stuff. And as towers get older, as this infrastructure gets older, hey, sometimes rehabbing guy anchor points is necessary. And that's an amazing process. So we will have uh, uh, Dave uh, Anderson on the show uh, next time that he can make it, and, and we'll we'll make room for, for Dave. So again, apologize that Dave wasn't able to be here today, and, and he apologizes too. Now, next week, we have a really interesting show. A famous engineer, great guy. Uh, he's been in the Washington, D.C. area for a long time. It's John Holt. He retired from WAMU at American University. And John has got an amazing collection of vintage microphones. And he's going to present some of those to us next week. I can't wait. Uh, John is a, just a terrific guy and uh, can't wait to see all these vintage microphones. He's quite knowledgeable. So that's Oops, coming up next week. Mics, yeah. Well, I, did a I did a jazz recording today. An artist yeah. came in. She's from the UK, and uh, she we set her up in the studio. Her and her guitarist. Do you mind if we use my microphone for the vocal? I'm like, sure, no problem. I mean, we have Neumanns. We're we're good. So no, I'd like to use mine. Sure. She brings out this little metal case, silver case. I'm like, oh wow, this is interesting. Clips, <laughs> you know, pops open the clips, opens up the case, and there is an RCA 44 ribbon mic. 
Ah. The, the large square one, the, the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. big guy. Yeah. yeah. And I said, that, that's your microphone? She goes, oh, yeah, I love the way it sounds. Okay. <laughs> so I just so happened to have a nice roll around boom that you usually see the microphones on in the, in right. the vintage videos or uh, cinema. And I roll this out, I put it on there. And she looks at me, she's like, wow, nobody's ever used a boom. I've always had to have a stand mic. This should be fun. <laughs> I'm like, this is too great. I'm like, I'm running with a, an RCA 44, which I, uh -huh. I have only, I think, used twice in my lifetime. And she travels with it as part of her repertoire of, of, of gear. So wow. take a vintage mic. Recorded a, uh, several songs using an R RCA 44. And she, I asked her, I said, where do you get the ribbon uh, rehabilitated or you know, you know, replaced when necessary? She goes, well, there's a guy in L.A. He's specialty is this but i live in france and in france they like to preserve things i found a few folks that can easily fix it and are more than happy to take care of the rca mics hmm. yeah, it's like look at that so we should be Amazing. fun next week we we're talking about microphones yeah 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 tell that story to, to john too i'm sure he'll be glad to hear it i bet john has some similar Absolutely. ones too yeah hey we got to go uh, Chris, thanks so much for being with us and uh, chatting. This has turned, you know, sometimes the ad hoc episodes turn out to be just the, the best ones. They're just great. And we'll get Absolutely. Dave Anderson back on back on uh, as soon as we can because I'm interested in Tower Rehab. Thanks to Suncast for producing today's show and working so hard to uh, get those videos up. Really appreciate that. Uh, also, Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. Appreciate him, too. Lots of other shows are on the GFQ Network. Check him out. And our great sponsors, the folks at the Telos Alliance with the new Omnia Volt audio processor under $3,500 bswusa.com we can order as late as uh, seven o'clock eastern time you can you can still order right now and have something shipped out from bswusa.com tonight and have it tomorrow and also by the folks at lavo at lavo.com slash twerk appreciate them very much we'll see you next week on this week in radio tech bye-bye everybody <laughs>